there, everybody. I thought I would uh, go ahead and get things started. Um, it looks like that uh, this is going to be mostly uh, taking a look at um, in the playback mode. And I thought tonight, because I have a feeling we're going to have some disturbances um, during the broadcast, that I introduce you to my official photo bomber here, Indy. And in the background there, you can see Rebel. He's uh, almost 15. So uh, those are my pups. So if you hear a little noise in the background tonight as we're continuing our chat um, and in regards to the purchase process, um, it'll be one of these two guys. So anyway, let's let's talk about the first time buyer um, and or just buying in general. Actually, a lot of times folks have um, purchased a home. It may have been a few years um, since they have purchased a home and things have changed. It's a lot different of a climate even since I began in real estate back in 2003. Things are a lot different. Lender programs, um, you know, the actual market itself, uh, the supply and demand. A lot of things have really changed. Um, the way that we even give, in, give information to you, um, you know, as far as assimilating, um, you know, what's gone on market, what's come off market, what market values are, the way that we do things have, has dramatically changed since 2003. So again, if I can remind you that uh, the information that I'm going to give to you is pretty general in, in the sort that every state kind of follows the same uh, scheme of things as far as you know the process of purchasing a home the stages that you're going to go through but each state is a little bit different so i mean there'll be a couple of things like um you know like in the state of new york um they've got a 30-day attorney review even after closing so there's a lot of unique things that go along with the actual purchase process that may vary from state to state to state so again what i'm going to be, be uh, providing to you is information that's applicable to the states of North and South Carolina. However, that being said, you know, um, it might help you out to kind of understand the process, even if it is in a different state and you, do, you follow some different rules a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to our screen here. So you can take a look at, uh, at what we've got going on here. So obviously I'm Kathy Smith from Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Carolina's Realty. Um, we're based out of uh, this office. My office is based out of Ballantyne, um, but I am all over the place. So anywhere that's uh, within the confines of North or South Carolina, I definitely can help you out there. So let's talk about the, the buying process. Obviously, um, if you're in a situation where you're ready to buy a home, <laughs> where the heck do you start? I mean, there's all kinds of information. There's a lot of HGTV um, that makes it look very, very easy. As a matter of fact, I've been on a couple of those shows um, as a technical consult um, in regards to the way things actually happen in the states of North and South Carolina. So let me tell you this, um, what you see on television, it makes it even more confusing because it's not as cut and dried and simple as it, as it seems. It's not like you call up somebody and just tell them you wanna buy their house and they go, great, we're done. And the next scene you've moved in and, and the dog's barking in the backyard. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. So a lot of folks are really confused when it comes to this part of the process because do you do you just drive around and, and start thinking about, about what you like first? Um, you know, because what do you like? You know, this is this may be your first home and you just don't know um, what strikes your fancy. I mean, it could be something uh, as simple as, um, you know, do you go townhome or do you go single family home? Do you go condo? Do you move to the lake? Do you move in the city? Um, do you move out in the suburbs? Do you move get yourself a kind of a more country style home? Do you just drive around? What? How do you start that? Some other folks wonder, you know, um, in regards to that, do you just, you know, when you start driving around, do you go ahead and, you know, download the Zillow app or uh, the realtor.com website? Uh, by the way, I do have a, an app for you, which we'll obviously discuss at some point during this process. Do you just download one of those and get started? You know, do you just start attending open houses when they're open every Saturday and Sunday? Now, here's the big question. Do you get financing arranged? I mean, obviously, if you know what you like, then, and you know what your rental payment is, that should be pretty much what you're gonna get in a mortgage, right? Not necessarily. There's some other terms that, that start coming into play, um, such as debt to income ratios, um, you know, your debt load, um, putting down a down payment. Um, you know, they're gonna be looking at, you know, your student loans, as a matter of fact, as part of the debt uh, equation. They're gonna be looking at the fact that, you know, you've got so much in reserves. Um, you know, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world is Dave Ramsey, and he always says that your housing payment should be no more than 25% of your income. Well, you know, that's pretty steep in a lot of cases. So a lot of lenders will go up to, you know, 36%, maybe even 42%, depending on how we're calculating that number um, for your housing payment. But even that being said, you know, the way that, that your income may be coming in, the way that you pay for things um, may 
predicate you know that your your actual housing payment itself be a little bit less or a little bit more. So there's a lot of complicated things going on. So do you call a realtor? Where does a realtor come into play with all of this stuff? So how just where what does the process mean and how do you take all these pieces? Obviously there's a lot of different moving pieces to this. How do you put them all together to be a cohesive kind of set and how does it make sense? Well, one of the things you should do is you should go ahead and start with your own realtor. Obviously, that's what I think, since this is what I do for a living. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, if we are kind of the, you know, I guess, in a way, you're kind of like the conductor of a symphony. We have all these different pieces performing in the orchestra. We've got the oboe, the flute, the timpani playing. You know, obviously, we don't want the guy that plays the bassoon to be really loud. We want to have this all making sense so it's a very pretty symphony that we're going to have. Um, you know, the thing is, is back in the early 90s was the first time they brought about what they call buyer representation. Um, and that allowed buyers to have their own representative in making the purchase process during in the, in the purchase process itself. So, you know, this is the fact that you can have one nowadays. It really helps you in the process. Now, one thing people don't really consider is the fact that sellers already have their own representative. They're the listing agent. So you'll probably meet them if you go to a lot of open houses and things of that sort. You run into a few of those guys. And boy, are they really, really nice people because I play them too sometimes. Now, the listing agent, you need to understand, they're there to protect the seller's interests and not yours at all. So the fact of the matter is, if you walk into an open house on a Sunday afternoon and you've been looking, you know, on Realtor.com and your Zillow app is about worn out from staring at, it, at the screen so much with it, and this is the only house that you've been able to find in the school district you've been looking for for six months in your price range that meets all your needs. You walk through this open house and you happen to blurt out where the listing agent hears you say, oh my gosh, this is perfect. I would spend $20,000 more for this house. I hope they don't figure out they've underpriced it. Well, my friend, I have some bad news to tell you. And that is the fact that what you've just blurted out is now mandatory for the listing agent to tell their client the seller. That's right, anything that they hear that could benefit their client, they have to repeat. So what do you think that's gonna do to your negotiating abilities? Gonna kill your leverage? <laughs> I think so. Now, something else to keep in mind when we talk about buyer's agents versus listing agents. The buyer is absolutely no cost to you, the, the buyer's agent is absolutely no cost to you as a buyer. The seller pays for it. Now, let me go back to before the early 1990s, late 80s um, for the states of North and South Carolina. They didn't have um, buyer representation at all. The only person who had a representative was the seller himself. And of course, the seller paid for his, uh, the commission was paid for his agent to represent him. So if it wound up that you happen to stumble across his agent or another agent, they'd still be representing the seller. No buyer would ever get represented. Now in the early 90s, late 80s, in that bought in that time frame, people got together with the uh, you know the Association of Realtors and said, "Listen, this is wrong. This is a legally binding contract. Don't you think that the buyer should have some say in this and some professional representation to make sure that their interests are being taken care of and they're not getting getting taken to the cleaners?" Well, that's when the that's when lives change. We became a state, two states that actually have buyer representation. Now, for the uh, seller and the buyer's agent, they're both being paid for by the seller. They're not, you know, the fact that they're being paid for by the seller does not conflict them as far as their interests. Obviously, they're there protect, to protect their client, but it has to be disclosed who's getting paid by whom. Now, a buyer's agent does more than just open doors, which some folks think that's all we do. We just run around and, uh, you know, open doors and show you pretty houses. We're there to, to provide you counsel and to advise you of the current market value. I've said many a time, this house is not worth the amount of money that they're asking for it. Um, let's come back in six months when realities hit them. Uh, trust me, I've said it a million times and I'll say it a million times again. I also advise my client when occurred in regards to the actual home inspection and the repair addendum process. And I tell them when, hey, this isn't right or this is right. This is you're getting a good deal. Um, I've had clients that have, uh, you know, been on a tear about a certain lender and unfortunately they took advantage of that client and they lost the home in foreclosure later. 
I did my best to talk her out of the out of buying the house. Um, unfortunately, that fell on deaf ears. But it's my job to make sure that you're making a wise decision that won't make you, as they say, house rich and cash poor. Now, you may go to a into a situation where you find the open house or you or you call the, the agent that their, their sign is in the yard and you say, hey, look, I'm interested in this house and you're thinking about writing an offer on it. And the listing agent says a couple of things to you. Have you ever heard this before? They could get you a better deal if you don't bring along your own buyer's agent. Have you heard that? How about this one? Oh, you don't need an agent. You know what you want. We're in good shape, right? Both of those are illegal. It's wrong to tell you that you can't have your own representation because there's one fact that, that they kind of left out. And that fact is, is that commissions were set prior to putting the house on the market. So even if there's only one agent left in that transaction, they're going to get all the commission. They're not going to be cutting that commission in half and giving you the benefit of only paying for one agent. So again, let me repeat this because it's very, very important. And a lot of first time buyers think if they find a client, find a client, find a house with an agent, and don't sign up as a client of any real estate agent, and they only use the one agent in the transaction who is the listing agent, it won't save them any money. They won't get the other half of the sales commission refunded. The listing agent is now really your best friend because you just made him or her twice as much money, and they don't have to deal with somebody else. And as a matter of fact, they don't have to worry about you either because they don't represent you. No one does. So the only thing that they'll be worried about are the interests of the seller in that transaction. Now, I know you're probably saying to yourself, illegal, really, seriously, I just wanna buy a house. Why does it have to be this complicated? Really, what does the role of the real estate agent play in all this? Can't I just buy the house myself? Well, there's a few other people we've got to come along to this party. So let me explain a few things to you and who, who is involved in purchasing a home. The first thing that has to happen, and I don't care what state you're involved with, you're buying a house in, they have to disclose something like this. This is the North Carolina Working with Real Estate Agents uh, mandatory disclosure. In South Carolina, they have one as well, and they just refer to that as the agency disclosure brochure. And that has to be on the first constant contact with you. So in other words, if you're going to start talking about how much house you can afford, if you're going to talk about your um, you know, it, it could be even just via email. It could be, um, you know, that you've met for the first time and you're looking at, at houses together. Well, on that first contact, they need to disclose to you how the rules of engagement are in regards to the, the game we know as real estate. Who represents who? Who has to disclose what to whom? What services does each real estate agent play in all of this? So I know probably right now your brains are probably spinning and you're saying to yourself, goodness gracious, are you serious? This is very complicated. Well, let me go ahead and confuse you a little bit more. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll actually find yourself a little bit more clear on the process. The first situation you could pop yourself up into is of having absolutely no representation. In the state of South Carolina, they refer to that as, as having a customer agent relationship. That's usually seen when, when you go to an open house or if you've gone to a builder where they have an on-site agent. That agent that you've met, their loyalty belongs to the other party to the transaction. In other words, the seller or the builder. What their job is, is that they're there to disclose no material facts about the property and or the situation. Let me give you an example. If for instance, um, we've got a situation on that house where they know that there's going to be a foreclosure auction at the courthouse steps on Thursday, and you've come along to this house on Sunday, that agent has to disclose that to you. The fact is, is that the bank may take possession of this property before you could actually own it. So they have to tell you those kinds of things. Now, if they find that there's a toxic waste dump in the backyard, well, they got to tell you that too, because I think that's pretty much a material fact about the property. That's the only thing that that agent owes you, the buyer. They need to treat everybody with fairness and honesty. So obviously they're not going to be ones to try to hide something from you but they need to disclose, but that's pretty much their entire job and responsibility to you. Now, if you get into a situation where you have yourself an agent, that's what we refer to as single agency. 
In South Carolina, they refer to that as a client agent relationship. So this one's pretty simple, and this is one of my favorites. One client, one agent, that simple. My buyer, my seller, but there's only one agent with each transaction. Now there's some, some things that, that that agent who is your representative owes you, and that's confidentiality. Let's go back to the situation where you stepped into the house and you've been looking for for a long time and you couldn't believe your eyes that you found the perfect place and it's, it's below market value. It's in the right school district. It's in your budget. My goodness, you would pay even $20,000 more for that. Now, if I'm showing you that house and you happen to blurt that out, I will giggle and say, that's right, but we'll still tell the other agent that it's overpriced. I don't owe that other agent or the seller um, the, to, sell, to tell them what you've told me in confidence. So we can talk strategy. We can talk about what your financial situation is. We can talk about your strategy as far as when you wanna move into a house. Everything that you tell me is to remain confidential. Now, if you ask me, you know, I really don't like that back bedroom painted purple. I mean, granted, we're all Prince fans these days, especially now, and sadly, but you want it to be, lav instead of being lavender, you'd like for it to be ivory. And if I think that's just a really silly thing to ask the seller, that doesn't matter. I still have to do what you have asked of me, obviously, if it's within a legal, you know, if it's a legal thing that you're going to ask me to do. So I can go ahead and, and, and do what you've asked me under your guidance. Now, in the process of buying a house, you're going to give me some money. You're going to give me um, an earnest money deposit, and potentially you're going to hand me a check to pro forward on to the sellers for the due diligence fee, if applicable. Well, obviously, I'm going to be, need to be able to tell you where that money went and how it's going to be applied to the purchase. So I need to be accountable to you in regards to handling of money. Now, again, my loyalty is to you. So you've told me these things in confidence. Um, you know, I know exactly where you want to go in regards to purchasing this house and where your heart is. Now, if there's a situation where, let's say, and builders have done this in the past, where they have offered agents a bonus for selling a house. So if it winds up where I get a $5,000 bonus for selling a house, um, you know, my, my loyalty is still to you no matter how much they've paid me. Obviously, I want to sell that house because I get a little extra money. But the fact of the matter is, is that if that situation is not proper for you, if I feel as though it's going to, you know, harm you in any way, like it's going above your budget, if it's not going to meet your needs, then my loyalty is still to you. I don't care how much they're going to pay me because it's still not enough money in my, in, in my book. Now, a couple of things that we need to consider here. Full disclosure. Now, obviously, when we're talking about disclosure of things, it's, you know, of the conditions of the property and in the seller, the seller's situation. So, obviously, I'm going to provide to you, um, you know, the state disclosure, the gas, oil, and mineral rights disclosure as well. Um, all that information is going to be provided to you. But anything else that I happen to hear from the other agent um, in regards to the selling of that property, um, again, if we go back to that situation where, you know, uh, the husband and wife, let's say the reason it's going to the courthouse steps on Thursday is because they're divorcing. Well, that information, obviously, I'm going to be telling you if I'm if it's something that is easily, um, you know, apparently, obviously, something that's easily found out. Now, obviously, if there's something where it's a, um, you know, they haven't disclosed this on the state disclosure statement, and it's something that somebody wouldn't obviously find out because it would take me going back for do a title search. At that point of end juncture in the transaction, I can't tell you that. But later on, once we do the title search, obviously that information I will disclose to you as soon as it is known. Now, this little gal right here is exactly how I feel when we get into a situation as we call dual agency. That is where both parties, both the buyer and the seller, have a client relationship with me, the agent. Usually that's found where the listing is mine, um, and I already have the buyer. We've been looking at other properties and I just think, oh my goodness, this is the perfect house for you. Let's go look at it. Well, now I represent both parties as clients. Just as a sidebar on this one, it's not a situation that I, I typically seek out. It's not one of my favorites because it is a very difficult uh, situation to be in for the agent. I have loyalty to both of you, both the buyer and the seller. I can't give either side an unfair advantage. And what typically will happen is, and it's just, just very innocent, people will say, well, would they take this much for it? 
what do you think they would do? Well, obviously I know because I have confidentiality agreements with both sides. I can't disclose that to the other. So I just have to say, use your best judgment. I can't help you. So obviously that's not something that I seek out on a regular basis. Now, again, I have to go back to, you know, disclosing material facts about the property and or the situation, just like, you know, the agent that you've met at the open house. And I have to treat everyone with fairness, fairness and honesty. But if you notice something happened, something changed. I didn't have the full list of uh, fiduciary responsibilities to the client. No longer, you know, am I going to give that, that higher level of counsel? Um, the confidentiality is still there, but I just can't disclose it to the other side. Um, I still have to account for the monies that are that I retain, you know, that put into earnest for earnest money and what have you. Um, but I really can't give that kind of counsel that I'm used to giving a regular client because both of you are clients. Are you confused yet? If you're not, hang on, I'll get you confused on this next slide. The next situation we refer to as the designated dual agency. And both the buyer and the seller have a client relationship with the brokerage. That's right, the brokerage, not the agent. So what's happened here is it could be two Berkshire Hathaway listings. Well, it could be a Berkshire Hathaway listing with two clients. So for instance, we go to one of my colleagues, open house on a Sunday afternoon, and that's their listing, but yet I represent you. So what happens is that even though both clients are represented by their own agents, we both report to the same broker in charge. That broker in charge has now become the designated dual agent. Dun, da, da, da. Look at that list of fiduciary responsibilities that I have to you. Now, my colleague who represents the seller would have that same list of responsibilities back to his client as well as I would you. But just know that the broker in charge is the one that sees everybody's paperwork and understands the situation from both sides because that he represents the brokerage and they, re they re represent both clients. So with that, are you confused yet? Hopefully not. But let's say, let's just say I'm going to make the assumption that you understand how important representation is because you have to understand that when we say all of these different situations appear and this is what, you know, this is what this type of agent is and da, 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 da. Someone ha somewhere has gotten the short end of the stick and had to sue or were in a situation where they just were really taken advantage of. That's why these things exist. So I know that you're probably thinking to yourself, I just want to buy a house. Isn't this the same as like buying a car? Well, I wish it were that easy, but unfortunately not everybody is the most honest ind individual out there. So we see situations where folks will take advantage of other people and we've had to do this. So having your own guide, so to speak, down the path to home ownership is really the most responsible uh, thing to do. And the, you know, and the fact of the matter is, is for a buyer's agent, they're free. So it doesn't hurt you at all to have one. So whether it is, you know, obviously I'd prefer it be me, be the agent that you call to become your uh, your buyer's agent. However, if it's not, I please highly, highly, highly encourage you to have one and not let it be the listing agent. You really do need a professional who does this on a daily basis because there are a lot of twists and turns in the game of real estate. Now, I will tell you this, that, you know, I've been in this business since 2003 and I still see things and I still have situations that pop up on a daily basis that I never could have expected. So a lot of really bizarre things happen. They even surprise me. 13 years later. So anyway, with that a little soapbox moment over, I'll go ahead and step down from that, but let's talk about this. Now you've got representation. Now what? This is where your lender comes into play. So we obviously need to talk to a lender in regards to that. So the first step is what we call the pre-approval or the pre-qualification letter. And really what the difference is between the two is one is worth, you know, uh, <laughs> the paper it's written on and the other one isn't. The pre-qualification letter is just saying that you had a moment that you picked up the phone and you called a lender and told him some things. He has no way of knowing if that's true or not. Um, he can't verify it. He hasn't had that opportunity to verify it. Um, and he's not going to, to put his neck out on the line until he does. But he's saying that based on the information that you told him on the phone, looks like you could get a loan for this much money. So the pre-approval letter, what they're doing at that point is they're actually pulling your credit and they, you know, they may even, depending on how far out you're going, they may even go to the point of verifying your income or your, your employment at that fact. 
So this may be a very strongly worded pre-approval letter. So if you have your oppor an opportunity to have either, I think the one you need to go for is the pre-approval letter because it's much stronger in this marketplace. Now, if I, if I may back, that, back away from this conversation for a moment to give you a little sidebar here, the Charlotte market has been increasingly hotter and hotter and hotter each year. So we're at the point now where houses are selling within hours. We've got multiple offer situations. Um, I had houses I showed on Sunday, wound up that we were the third uh, folks to walk through the door and they already had two other offers already on the table. And they were going to be making their decision on the highest and best offer within about 45 minutes from our walking through the house. So this is very common. So obviously you wanna step up your game and make sure that you know the, the uh, approval letter that you have is very strongly worded and know that it's from a reputable firm um, that will be able to back up what they promise on their piece of paper. So something else to, to take into consideration here is who the heck do you call? <laughs> you know, you could go online and pull up a lender, you know, uh, you know, and see who has the best rates from bank rate. Um, but I highly recommend that you ask some people that you know. So if you have an agent, which I'm hoping you do for given this slide saying that you have a representation and after I've beaten you up over the whole representation thing, I'm hoping that, that you would ask me, who do I work with? Who do I like? Who do I not like? Um, ask your family, ask friends, ask coworkers, um, because everybody has their own set of experiences and some are good, some are bad. And you kind of have to, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of ferret out some of the, some of the opinions though, when you get to, get to the point of asking too many folks, um, because obviously the larger firms are going to have a lot of, uh, business and, you know, not everything's going to go smoothly. Whereas a smaller brokerage may have, um, you know, fewer deals and not even be heard of before. However, that being said, I will say this, um, I have relationships with a couple of lenders and I only keep it my list of lenders that I would recommend to two. And there's a really good reason for that. And that is because um, I believe that a lender recommended by me as well as an inspector or a closing attorney or whomever I might recommend to you, um, is it a reflection of my business? It's almost an extension of, of what I do. So I want to make sure that whomever that I recommend to you um, is of the highest, highest caliber and that you have a great experience as a result of that. So, you know, going back to, you know, recommendations from me, these lenders know that, you know, I only have two and they want to continue to get my referrals um, from my clients to them to continue to, to grow their business as well. So the nice thing about it is, is that those lenders feel a higher level of accountability back to me um, where, Whereas you might call somebody a one-off somewhere, you know, just a, somebody that you happen to find, maybe it's your, your bank or what have you. Um, they may not feel as highly accountable back to you because that's one loan that they will get. Now with me, um, typically speaking in, in my line of work, um, I'm going to be selling anywhere between three and $5 million a year. That's a lot of mortgages. So obviously if, the, if there's a bad experience, I'm going to take them off the list. So that being said, you know, my recommendations come highly vetted, so to speak. You also want, even though I may make rec recommendations to you for the loan officer or your friends do, your coworkers, you want to make sure that the loan officer that you meet up with um, understands you and they appreciate your business. Now, I've had folks that have come to me and said, look, I just felt like a number. I didn't feel like I mattered to anybody or anything. The big thing for me is to find a lender who has the heart of a teacher. And if I'm sounding like Dave Ramsey, please forgive me. But this person wants to make sure that you understand the entire loan process and understand what you're getting yourself into. So you don't want to be in a situation where um, you're signing documents and you don't know what you've just signed. And you don't understand what APR is versus your interest rate. You don't understand what happens next. A really good lender, which are the ones that I recommend, will take the time to sit down with you and say, okay, here's what to expect next. Now, in addition to that, because I've done this for so long, um, I don't have any problems with you making a call to me and saying, look, I, I know that this lender explained this to me, but I really don't understand what this means. Can you explain it? And I'm more than happy to do that. Just because this may be your first house, the good news is it's not mine. <laughs> So, but the good lenders will take the time to really explain things to you and make sure you feel comfortable with the process because it is very intimidating. And I like to tell my clients too, that during the process of getting a home loan, you're going to feel like you're so scrutinized 
that no one trusts you and that you know you feel like a criminal before it's all said and done well that's underwriting for you and they're kind of evil people in my opinion but that's what they're paid to do they have to be scrutinized because they are the gatekeepers for the bank's money so they want to make sure that if they're going to be lending out money to folks that that it's actually going into hands that will actually repay them at some point so that's why there's there's such high scrutiny now the good news is we've got our pre-approval letter what do we do now we go shopping so the good news is the interest rates are so low right now that folks are able to actually buy more house than they have been able to in many many years now some folks you know in the process of this they get so caught up in the oh my gosh i can i can get a house worth x amount of dollars that's what i'm approved to one of the things that you need to make sure that when you have those conversations with the lender to get your approval letter that they tell you what their estimated amount is for your mortgage payment every month now obviously there are four things that go into a, a mortgage payment your principal which is repaying the loan the interest what money they're making off of you your taxes and insurance now, two things will be, you know, estimates, but won't be locked in are your taxes and your insurance. Obviously, that's going to change in regards to the property that you purchase, but they can kind of give you a rough guideline of what it would be. Now, something else, a little caveat to put in there is if you're looking for um, a, a townhome or a condo, there will be HOA dues, and those really vary wildly. So depending on the amount of HOA dues, that may actually impact the amount of money you'll be able to borrow um, to keep your payments down. So obviously when you're talking to these lenders and you're getting your approval letter, you're also talking to them and saying, okay, what is my, what do you expect my payments to be? And if they're saying an amount that doesn't feel comfortable to you in your budget, because you know your budget better than anybody else, then you tell that lender, no, I don't feel comfortable with that. Here's where I wanna be. What kind of house can I get for that money? When we find out that number, then I'm able to help you out and start looking for houses that will fit those parameters um, as far as the cost. And then, of course, we talk about the good stuff, about what it is that you'd like, the fenced-in yard for the puppies, um, you know, it's something that has a great view, um, you know, your condo on the lake, may maybe, I don't know. But whatever it is that you like, we can start looking at within those parameters once we know the, the budget that we have to work with. Now, once we've found the one, as we've done our work to go find that great house, there's a lot of work to be done. The first thing that's gonna happen is that I'm gonna do a quick market analysis to ensure that the offer price we're gonna make is reasonable. In this marketplace, obviously, um, we're in a situation where it is becoming a seller's market. Sellers are able to ask a lot more for their houses um, than they have in years past. So obviously, you know, where they're listing the house, sometimes that's a starting point. However, that being said, I don't want you to spend too much for a house that won't appraise. And I don't want you to be in a house that costs too much that you won't be able to get that money back out you know, in the long run. So the first thing I'm gonna do is do a market analysis. And obviously I can't predict what the future will be for that house, but I can tell you historically what has happened in that subdivision. And if the, re the offer that we're gonna make is a reasonable amount to pay for that house. This is where our lender comes back into play. They're gonna give us a great pre-approval letter to show the seller that you're able to make that purchase and it'll be customized just for that property. Then that after the offer is accepted, you're gonna be expected to put down some earnest money and potentially some due diligence money at the time of the offer to show you're sincere about actually making that purchase. Typically speaking, the furthest out that will go is five business days after the contract is accepted. So we go from the point of an offer, when it's accepted, that's when it becomes a contract. So now, in Charlotte, where things are really hot with multiple offers, just because we've made an offer, don't start doing any happy dance yet. Until they accept it and it becomes a contract, it's still up for sale for anybody else. But once it becomes a contract, then the house is yours. Well, so to speak. Once we've gotten you under contract, time becomes of the essence. This is when the first week after getting on a contract, it really, you really will lose your mind. And there's a lot of things that have to be done within that first 10 days or so um, of, of the contract acceptance. So we have a very short window of opportunity to formally apply for a mortgage and pay your appraisal fee. That's when an appraiser goes out to the property and says what he believes market value is for that property in the, um, in the light of 
what the mortgage will be. So he wants to make sure the bank's interests are protected, that you're not paying too much for that property. So he's kind of our, our fail safe. He's our, our second line of defense, so to speak, in regards to market value. Now, at the same time, your agents, hopefully me, will be scheduling inspections. So we'll be talking about home inspections, pest inspections, radon inspections, well and septic, chimney inspections, all kinds of stuff. So anything that you think might affect your decision to make that purchase of that property, we need to investigate. So even at the same time we're doing that, we need to take a look at, you know, um, the homeowners association and things of that sort. Um, you know, we need to investigate the school district, make sure the school district is proper for that house. Um, once we have found out all that information, so even the termite inspection, which is very popular here in the South, um, termites exist two of those little critters per quarter acre, so you can't get rid of them. So they're gonna be there. It's a matter of time before they get to a property. So obviously getting a termite inspection is very important because you don't wanna find out that they're chewing on the house of your dreams. So once we find out all of our information, then we can ask the seller to make repairs to that property, although it's not expected. In the state of North Carolina, all properties are assumed to be sold in as is, where is condition. Now you can ask the seller, okay, let's fix some things, but they don't have to. It's not a law that they have to fix anything. But if it's a material fact, which is kind of a major deal, it has to be reported and you know to any potential buyers in the future as well for that property. Now, the due diligence period, we're talking about this whole due diligence period. And this is our window of opportunity to do our inspections, to do our uh, appraisal, get the results back, all those kinds of things. There is a deadline. So we have to make sure that that you apply, literally when you find out that your house, that the house is under contract the next day or that day or that evening, get back in touch with your lender and make that application for the mortgage and go ahead and pay for that appraisal fee, which will typically run you anywhere between 375 and $500. It just depends on the loan, depends on the lender, depends on a lot of things. But it all has a deadline. We need to get that information back as quickly as possible because there's some negotiations that need to be done with the seller as a result. So I know that you're probably getting confused going, due diligence, what the heck is this? This is the time frame where it allows, it allows for loan application, inspections, your survey to be completed, review of all the HOA documentation. I mean, if they tell you you can't have dogs and, you ha and you're a huge dog nut, obviously that property is not right for you. But you got to find that out. If the school information is right for you, if um, you know what the appraisal results come back. If you are big into feng shui, get your feng shui master in there, have him review the property and let's see what directions the doors are in and those kinds of things. And if there's a quick cure for it, you think I'm being silly, but it is true. There are some folks that really believe in these kinds of things. And to me, that's very, very important. So anything that may impact your decision negatively or positively, you need to investigate it. So it needs to be everything. And it all has to be done within that window. And it is stated in the contract. So once due diligence is done, what next? Well, the lender's gonna be asking you for a lot of documentation. And you'll see a lot of times where you've provided some information and the processor or the underwriter's taken a look at it and said, mm, this was good, but we need more. We need a little bit more detailed information. So the lender's gonna be continually asking you for some more lender documentation. Simultaneously, the attorney's going to be reviewing some documentation for you. They're gonna be pulling title work um, they're going to be seeing the chain of ownership, making sure that any previous mortgages have been cleared from the purchase of that property. The lender themselves, I mean, the attorney will be uh, ordering the survey for you if you so decide that you would like to have one. And the attorney is going to be taking a look at that and seeing if there's any encroachments. Or, for, in, for example, if um, the neighbor next door has put a fence on your property. Did you know, depending on the property and the way that that fence was put on the, on the property line, that within 10, between 10 and 20 years, that that property could become theirs for free. That's right. This is kind of something you want to find out ahead of time rather than walking into a situation where somebody has your land. Now, after due diligence, after it's all said and done on the day of closing or a couple of days beforehand, we'll do what we call the final walkthrough. And what the final walkthrough does is it gives us the opportunity to ensure that the property is going to be given to you in the condition that is acceptable to you, obviously. Um, if there have been any repairs, you want to make sure that they were done to your satisfaction. Obviously, if we've called for contractors to do some work, we have the receipts and we have a company to go back to if there's a problem. However, that being said, it's usually good to, to make sure everything's in, in tip-top shape prior to closing. 
So we'll do that walkthrough to ensure that. And something else that you may or may not think of is the fact that the condition that you saw the property in on the day that you wrote the offer, it ne needs to stay that way um, through to the day of closing. So they have to keep mowing the grass, for instance. Yeah, that's right, they have to. Then we have closing. It's a good day. That's where you actually sign all your lender documents um, and you know do the final review of any termite letters, um, any uh, contractor receipts. So all those things are be pulled together by your attorney. And that's where we'll meet is at the attorney's office to sign and review these documents together. Then guess what? The keys and to move in. Isn't that great? So that's when you officially get to move into your house. So this is the entire process. And of course, hopefully you'll have those happy little smiley faces too, um, even though you'll be very, very exhausted. So that my friends is the start to finish. Um, in regards to making a purchase for your first home. And it, it's pretty much the same process if you're going to be a repeat buyer as well. So I hope that even though we've kind of spun through these things fairly quickly, um, I hope it's kind of given you some things to think about and perhaps uh, open up a conversation in your household um, in regards to making that decision to buy your first home. Now, obviously, I'm doing this live stream as a hope that I could educate you folks um, when it comes to making your first purchase or buying a second home. But also I hope when the time comes and that you're looking to either sell or buy your, buy your next place, that I'm the agent that you call. But I invite you to come check out my website and that's www.homesbykathysmith.com. I've also provided my email address and yes, it is kathya.smith at bhhscarolinas.com. And I've also given you uh, my Facebook page um, as well to kind of keep in line, keep up with the feed of, of my constant stream of wild uh, thoughts. Um, in addition, I've also put up my mobile app um, on the screen. And if you happen to be, if you're anything like me, you've probably got your phone sitting nearby while you're watching this on a computer screen or your iPad. Um, so feel free, you can go ahead and scan that QR code that'll take you right to my mobile app. And what's really cool about the mobile app is granted you on your phone, It'll be a very basic kind of search. You can actually click on show me houses that are available for sale or for rent in the local area. Um, but if you're using something more like a tablet, like an iPad um, type of device, it can actually, you can actually put layers on. So for instance, if you're interested in finding out uh, where the local schools are, um, you can look find, find a house and then you can click on that layer. Or if restaurants are your thing, click on that. Um, there's a lot of different layers that you can play with on that. So anyway, I appreciate you guys uh, coming by and checking out my first live stream for the buyers. And I appreciate any feedback you might be able to give me. So feel free, drop me an email back, post on my Facebook wall or give me some comments here in the chat room as I would love to uh, you know, answer them for you and to help you when it comes time to buy your first home. Thanks so much for coming.